Welcome back to War Economy and State, the foreign policy podcast of the Ludwig von Mises Institute at Mises.org. That's M-I-S-E-S dot O-R-G. Now, this week, we're going to talk about the, the true economics of wars of attrition, uh, specifically the war of attrition going on in Ukraine right now. And it turns out that wars aren't nearly as cheap as the United States seemed to think they were going to be in the, the new world of warfare. And we're going to talk about this this time, how there had become this doctrine in the U.S. that uh, wars from now on were going to be agile and cheap and in precision and based on very small numbers of highly technological uh, bits of, of equipment. And it turns out we've learned in Ukraine that's not actually the truth at all, that uh, we're still facing the same old uh, economic warfare problems and industrialization problems in terms of war that we faced decades ago. And really remarkably little has changed when you're talking about wars between peer countries. So we'll get into the, so, some of those uh, details. And speaking of government spending and expensive stuff, I want to note that the Mises Institute is currently giving away 100,000 copies of Murray Rothbard's What Has Government Done to Our Money? This is a classic text uh, I believe from the 60s, and it's short too, mercifully short. If you're like me and you like short books, uh, you'll like this book. You can uh, read it in a couple afternoons, and it's really just an excellent, remains one of the best summaries of uh, where money comes from. How does money uh, retain purchasing power? What happens when you inflate, and what does that have to do with business cycles? If If you really need a refresher, or an introduction to all of these concepts about why specifically inflation is bad, uh, and not just in terms of price increases, but also what it does to the economy overall. I highly recommend this book, and you can just go to mises.org slash money, and you can get multiple copies if you want. Uh, if you want to read one, give a few away, uh, you can go right there, and there's just a form that you fill out. That's mises.org slash money. Okay, now uh, to the episode with me, joining me is my co-host, as always, for War Economy and State, Zachary Yost. And Zach, uh, you had, uh, I often ask you, what do you want to talk about? And uh, in, the, in the past, we've uh, approached this issue sort of tangentially, the issue of, okay, well, Russia, the Soviet, the former Soviet Union, they're still using, at least until recently, a bunch of old Soviet munitions still. I'm not sure if they've used that up yet, but... Uh, they're just cranking out munitions because that's what so much of this Ukrainian war is about, is just a bunch of nonstop shelling. This involves a lot of war materiel being cranked out. And meanwhile, the United States is basically running out of its munitions because it has not mobilized in a way that the Russians have to produce this sort of output. Now, of course, that's generally a good thing. You mobilize and you crank out a bunch of munitions, that all takes away from wealth and from standard of living uh, of everybody who's not involved in the war machine. Uh, so let's approach some of these issues. And I think a good place to start is with an article you sent me recently uh, called, In a War of Attrition, You Want an Economist as Defense Minister. So Zach, kind of kick us off here. Outline some of the basic issues that we're talking about. What what's the deal with this current war, and why? And what is its connection to the economy and to quote unquote efficiency that we'll define as we go forward? Uh, and and so why is it necessary to maintain this close connection between economic output and warfare if you actually want to win the war? And we'll just talk about kind of some of the historical context of this as well. Uh, but um, yeah, go ahead and, and start us off with this article, and we'll link to it in the, uh, the description as well. Right. So uh, Putin was recently reelected as president of Russia. I forget which term this is. Fifth, maybe. <laughs> it's getting up there. Almost certainly his last term. But uh, uh, with his re-election, there's been a bit of shuffling around, and the Russian Minister of Defense, Shoigu, it, the general consensus is, has been demoted to the, the head of the State Security Council. So he's not been sent to be like governor of Kamchatka or something. Uh, he's still uh, important and in the circle, but 
the part of why it's generally believed he's been uh, moved on is he's pretty corrupt and pretty openly corrupt. There's lots of corruption in Russia. <laughs> it's even more corrupt than Ukraine, if that gives you <laughs> any idea of how things are run there. And one of his deputies was actually just arrested. And in the raid, they just found like millions of dollars or rubles or whatever and gold and stuff at his big mansion. So it's obvious, you know, he's skimming off the top. And he's been replaced with someone named Andrei Belusov, who is an economist. And he's quite an interesting fellow. I'd never heard of him before, but uh, he has no prior connection to the military. Uh, and he has, I've seen people refer to him actually as Soviet royalty. Uh, his father and mother were both important Soviet academics, and uh, I don't know any of the details, but his father apparently attempted to engineer some sort of, uh, I don't know if we'd say pro-market reforms in the sort of seventies, but more, you know, let's ease up on the controls some. And apparently that didn't go anywhere. But he's uh, very much from the Soviet tradition. And what's also notable is he's referred to as a statist. <laughs> and this isn't in, you know, like libertarian saying, you're the statist. No, you're the statist. This is like mainstream people <laughs> saying he's a statist in the sense of he's in favor of more government control and direction of things. Well, this is a technical term from the 20th century Mises talked about. Uh, this etatism. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, it has a very, uh, very thick pedigree in Nazi Germany, the idea of statism. And yeah, I mean, it's basically central planning. So um, just to get an idea of what that word means, it doesn't mean he's okay with the existence of government. It means he has a very specific agenda, and that is right. central economic planning. Exactly. And in Russia, uh, the I I'm pretty sure most or all of the defense industry is state-owned companies, which is really, it's crazy uh, just in the course of trying to read some more about this. I mean, there are like state-owned companies going bankrupt and being bought by other state-owned banks, and it's just, it's, it's a quite a convoluted system. So he is now in in charge, and of course, he's not planning, you know, the tactical maneuvers or anything like that. That's taken care of by the general staff. He really is there to organize the production of war resources. And modern war just consumes insane amounts of resources. I, I think that in Desert Storm, uh, or uh, yeah, I think in Desert Storm, a US armored division ate up somewhere like 18,000 tons of supplies every day. And uh, the difference actually in artillery usage, I mean, Russia probably fires more artillery rounds in one day in Ukraine than the uh, US military fired during the entire war, the, 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 the Persian Gulf War, uh, because we focus instead on aerial artillery in the form of aircraft, whereas Russia is much more tube artillery focused. And you can't get enough of these shells, basically. Now, the, it would not be surprising if Belusov actually leads to some increases in the output, <laughs> cleans up this horribly corrupt sector of the Russian sort of state-run economy, just because corruption is so rampant that you know, just by eliminating corruption, there's going to be an improvement in output. Um, but there is, I and I uh, tune in to some Russian nationalist types every so often to see their take on things. And they think, oh, this, eco this war, great for the economy. Everything's booming. Oh, everyone is getting jobs. Wages have risen a lot. Uh, but as... Austrians have a lot of insight to, and uh, we'll link to a lecture from Mises U uh, that Matt McCaffrey gave in 2018 on the economics of war, where he sort of predicts exactly what seems to be happening in Russia in terms of, <laughs> it seems like, oh, all this demand and everything, but, and, and currently, according to the stats, wages are outpacing inflation, but that 
I'm highly skeptical that will continue. People are like, oh, I can buy a washing machine now. Well, more and more resources from the economy are going to be driven into the uh, military industrial base. And it's currently something where the military budget, I believe, is roughly around 7.5% of Russian GDP. And uh, Russian leadership seems to be aware that sort of in the 80s, when the war, the military industrial base in the Soviet Union went insane, it was eating up a huge portion of the economy. This contributed to the collapse of the Soviet Union. So they sort of want to try and prevent that from happening. This, uh, this uh, um, Belusov, that's likely in his sort of portfolio. Cut down on corruption, decrease uh, blatant inefficiencies, although as we'll get to in the rest of this episode, a state-run war economy is going to be very... Uh, inefficient at its own sort of version of goals by definition almost and prevent the war military industrial base from cannibalizing too much of the economy uh so that's sort of the groundwork for what's going on and uh, sort of setting the tone for the rest of the episode so i mean let's just right now define what we mean by efficiency so we can talk about uh, what we we can talk about efficiency in war to some extent without there being confusion. So as you note, right, and I remember McCaffrey's talk on this topic. He's written a couple good articles about it too. Is that when you're talking about efficiency from an Austrian viewpoint, an efficient economy is an economy that reflects the actual desires of savers, investors, and consumers and entrepreneurs. So that it's an unhampered economy. Your economy is efficient if it's delivering the goods and services that people actually want. Now, if you have a wartime economy and huge amounts of funding is in taxes and treasure is all going to purposes that are just centrally planned by government planners for purposes of the war, then by definition, your economy is not inefficient because no one's consulting the consumers whether they want to be taxed into oblivion to pay for this war that the central planners really like. And we do, and we, as we've discussed in many episodes, the desires of ordinary people do not necessarily coincide with what the regime thinks is necessary in terms of warfare. And you can see just that in the fact that they have to use the draft and conscription a lot of time, right? If people agreed with the government's war aims, you wouldn't have to draft anybody. These people would all volunteer. And uh, of course, the state acts like, oh, people are free riding. Don't people understand that, uh, that we need to fight this war? Well, actually, maybe a lot of people just don't care. And maybe they would just be fine uh, with a change of regime uh, as long as they could go on back to their lives. And it's, uh, this is, of course, every war is portrayed as some apocalyptic thing and that everybody should care deeply about it. But the fact of the matter is, is that many consumers and entrepreneurs know that they would that their lives wouldn't actually change that much based on the outcome of a war. And this has historically been the reality. But instead, the government seizes all of this, this wealth and treasure, and they spend it in ways uh, that the regime wants. And that is, by definition, in the Austrian thinking, inefficient, because it's just, it's, it's wealth, it's wealth produced by consumers and entrepreneurs, and then that wealth is wrenched away from them and instead of those people buying things for their families or for their businesses that they would have bought, that money all goes to pay for some foreign adventure. And uh, so that's what, keep in mind, that's the real definition of efficiency from uh, a, a true economist standpoint. Now, however, we're stuck with this word in some other uses as well. So the context that we'll be using the term here is in the concept of uh, bang for buck. Bang for your buck is a phrase, of course, pioneered somewhat. I'm, I don't know if he invented the phrase or if he just popularized it. Robert McNamara, the de um, defense uh, secretary back during Vietnam, was saying we need more bang for our buck in Vietnam. So we can, we can deliver more units of bang, that is explosions against the Vietnamese per dollar. And so when you're talking about efficiency in warfare, that is, that is one definition you can use. And that's what we'll talk about here is the amount of stuff you can blow up for one dollar. And so when we're talking about Andrei Belusov and uh, people like Donald Rumsfeld, the, uh, uh, the American defense secretary from 20 years ago, they talked a lot in terms of, OK, we're going to have very efficient military and we're going to be able to deliver a lot of military capability for smaller amounts of dollars. And so we won't have to mobilize as much, but still have the same output of war-making power. 
and uh, so that is a that is a problem that governments face all the time. Is without completely destroying their economy, how much out war making output can they produce without starving the population? And this is related to lots of issues. Uh, and why it's so important that uh, your economy have a high per capita um, uh, situation, high uh, GDP per capita situation, if you want to have uh, a, a significant amount of war-making capability. Just having a large population isn't enough because uh, people need to eat. So if your military capability comes from just large numbers of people, well, that's that's actually extremely expensive to maintain large amounts of people in the field when those people could be replaced by uh, artillery capability, by airplanes, by basically more efficient machinery uh, instead of just relying on a bunch of guys wandering around with guns to carry out your war-making power who get blown away in large numbers, and that's bad for your economy also. So what are we talking about here in terms of we need to align then our economy in terms of bang for buck? And we, along these lines, if you want a good background on what that means for the United States, you can see that in a great article we have posted on our site by Hunt Tooley. And he's a historian with the Mises Institute. And he looks at, and this is basically the American version of the article that Zach is, as, is talking about, where do we appoint economists to be our defense ministers, quote unquote, our secretaries of defense? And the truth is, to some extent, we do. Now, they're, not, they're generally not full-blown economists, but they're people with deep roots in the business community and people who have lots of connections to... Uh, munitions uh, creators to weapons manufacturers to what were called in World War One merchants of death. And in order to be an effective, from the state's viewpoint, an effective uh, defense secretary, you have to have these abilities and these connections. And uh, so Hunt Tooley writes this in his article. It's called Guardians of the Warfare State, where he looks at what sort of person gets appointed to be uh, a secretary of defense. And he actually creates, he looks at all these averages and actually creates the, what's your average defense secretary looks like. And uh, talks about how this person, um, <laughs> they, the, the average uh, secretary of defense, uh, he comes from Western Pennsylvania. Uh, he comes from a sturdy middle-class background. And he was, he was a bright, hardworking kid. That's one aspect here is that you do not, uh, appoint your secretary of defense based on like his pedigree or his old family money connections or anything like that. They need efficient people to be secretary of defenses. They need someone who maybe comes from middle class family. He went, of course, to Yale probably. And he has these, these deep connections with weapons manufacturers and in a way to get resources to the war. And so that is what you want. Uh, and he says here, our ideal man, and they are all males, <laughs> would definitely be on the Council of Foreign Relations after 1922. After having served for three or four years of Secretary of War Defense, he will go back to business, almost certainly investment banking, because that's where he came from. He came from the finance world in many cases. And so he knows where to get the money and the financing for war. And, uh, and so tons of bankers in this world. He would also maintain extensive board memberships, consultative positions, and other connections to the arms industry. And he would be connected with the worlds of both government task forces and the great tax-free foundations like the Ford Foundation, Rand, etc., and maintain close connections to Lehman Brothers, Morgan, Jacob Schiff, and Golden, Goldman Sachs. So you can see this is, okay, they're not economists, but they're bankers. They're investment bankers. They're business people. They're deep in this world. And I think that just illustrates uh, how important it is to your war-making capability as a state to be connected to the financial world because that's how you're able to harness the economic power of a state and turn it into war-making power. So, of course, the Russians are aware of this, and it seems like uh, – uh, Putin's trying to maybe streamline that process a little bit as well. Right. Yeah. And it, 
the to go back to a point you made in the introduction sort of once iraq happened the war on terror was a thing uh there was a big strategic shift from uh you know like oh boy we have to be prepared for a giant conventional war in the middle of europe we have to be prepared to defend the fold a gap uh you know that's why germany fielded numerous divisions there were tens of thousands of british soldiers on the continent all this stuff and once the soviet union collapsed uh Europe especially wound down just everything because they could free ride on the United States. And the United States uh, shifted to what was termed in the literature a lot of hybrid war, basically this idea of everything will be Iraq and Afghanistan for the future. Big states will never fight each other again. <laughs> well, that's that's nonsense. Even if states are in conflict, they'll be using proxies in, you know, third world countries to fight each other. Well, uh, you know, Ukraine just happened. And there's a very good article by Patrick Porter, who's a realist, called Out of the Shadows, Ukraine in the Shock of Non-Hybrid War, where he just points out all how this was like the holy writ for a long while. And now we're in this situation where, uh, you know, you can't get enough munitions to send to Ukraine. And even though... The government passed the ginormous bill to send gajillions of our dollars to other countries. There's, it's not, uh, it's not like we have all this stuff just sitting around to send to Ukraine. It's a huge issue of increasing production, and there, the U.S. military-industrial base is incredibly inefficient, uh, in part because it's it's practically just a government subsidiary. In some cases, literally, the government operates some munitions factories. In other cases, the government owns a munition factory and it's run by contractors. And then there's like six firms. Uh, you know, there's actually a lot more diversity and competition in uh, the military industrial base during the Cold War. Then there was something called the Last Supper, where the defense secretary, I don't remember who at the time, called all the people together and was like, all these defense factories for a big dinner and was like, yeah, we're going to be cutting spending. And uh, I've seen interesting flowcharts of basically everything's consolidated into six firms, which are like Boeing, Lockheed, Martin, Raytheon. Uh, I, I can't remember the other three. But basically, there's six firms. There's like no competition there, obviously, in the true sense. Obviously, there's mostly one customer, which is the United States government. So uh, now we're in this situation. And I think that um, there's several points here that are relevant for, for, for consideration. One is the economic ignorance or just duplicity of cheerleaders for the warfare state. And I'd say the most high profile of them right now is Mark Thiessen. I think he, he was involved in getting us into Iraq and is now at AEI, I believe. He keeps writing all these articles saying, you know, all this money we're spending to create weapons and stuff to send to Ukraine, that's, that's all being spent here in America. But uh, he is what Bastiat would call a bad economist <laughs> because he does not look at the second and third order effects of this. It, it's uh, very, it's how does building something, you know, an artillery shell, which is going to be sent away for free and then blown up, that does not create any wealth. And I think it sort of speaks to the way in which so many people today just confuse wealth and money. They just seem to not understand the material aspect of war. Uh, it, it doesn't matter how much money we print. Uh, paper, or nowadays digits on the computer, bits on the computer, don't actually feed people, and they don't actually, you know, kill people on the opposing side in a war. So this is just either ignorance or duplicitousness. But... I would say there's the other aspect of all this is why I think it's important to talk about and why I would encourage more, you know, Austrians and economically literate people to think about this issue and to read 
more Rothbard and Mises and Hayek, because they all talked about this issue, war financing and just sort of the, you know, the reality of war that's tied to actual economic reality, is because the chance is low. But it's so concerning that there is a possibility that we could become embroiled in a war with Russia. Uh, it's not super likely, I would say, but the more I listen to people who are just crazy, uh, who want to take chances, who seem to not be scared of nuclear weapons, uh, and just two prominent examples, the Prime Minister of Estonia, uh, which is smaller than the Pitro Pittsburgh metro region, uh, said that the aim of this war in Ukraine should be to break up Russia into, you know, the Russian Federation should be just dissolved into its constituent parts. And I was watching this sort of panel on DW, which is sort of the German version of the BBC. And then this guy who was a chief of staff to a former German defense minister, which makes this whole thing just ridiculous because Germany is so weak and just free riding off the US. But he was advocating that NATO forces based in Romania and Poland should start shooting down Russian missiles and drones and things. And the other two people on the panel were, you know, like, what are you talking about? This is craziness, basically, in a more uh, polite manner. But if a war were to happen, it would completely upend our society, the amount of resources that would need to be reallocated into the military industrial base, the amount of, I mean, we would have to have conscription. There's no question of that. And I, I had an article last year pointing out that like, there's some talk of this now, uh, the, the U S would be able to sustain like a month at most of casualties at the level that they're happening now in Ukraine. So obviously there would have to be a draft. Obviously there would have to be basically a wartime economy mobilized. So obviously we want to avoid getting into this war. And it's, as I said, it's, I don't think it's likely, but were it to happen, we would, I think, want to be in a position to argue as to, uh, here's how the best way to wage this war while preserving freedom, because war is the health of the state. And, uh, as Hayek pointed out in this very interesting sort of a symposium that I just became aware of, and it's on the Mises website, actually, uh, he points out, you know, all these economic controls that are instituted during war, they tend to not go away. And this also touches on Robert Higgs' ratchet effect. So I would just say, I think this is a very important subject that people need to think about and that we have you know, a libertarian and Austrian tradition to draw on in arguing, you know, on how to understand war, war and a war economy. Well, and let's just be crystal clear, right? War is not good for the economy. Yep. War is good for certain special interests. But as we noted, it's not efficient in any way, in any way that you would define as in a good economics uh, way in that it's just it's removing resources from the private sector handing them over to the government sector and then consuming it this money is not invested it's consumed it's used to blow things up and given that every war the us has been in except maybe the war in the pacific like the not even the war in europe the war in the pacific being like the one possible exception every war that the us has ever fought has been unnecessary and so that's you just look at that and you're like, OK, well, how did that improve the economy? It didn't. Um, these are totally unnecessary wars. And most, I mean, just consider consider the amount of money spent on World War One, which in no way benefited the United States and, of course, arguably caused World War Two. Um, that was just boatloads of money stolen from the taxpayers and then spent on artillery and on getting American boys blown apart. So, OK, how did that help the economy? It didn't. And we can see that in World War II, of course, is that it didn't end the Depression. The Depression didn't end until the end of the war. And that was it was only then that we started to see GDP in terms of the private sector increase at all. It's easy to increase GDP with tons of government spending. And of course, the war lessened unemployment <laughs> because you were drafting people and sending them off to the war, giving them war jobs. And even the private sector people suddenly be became handed over to the war effort 
and were working long, long hours. My uh, grandfather worked for Pratt Whitney Aircraft. He made airplane engines. And of course, during the war, then that all became military airplane engines. And according to my dad, his father during the war worked 19 hours a day, basically. And because even the people, even the airplane mechanics they had, had to work all the time uh, because there was such a worker shortage to crank this stuff out. But, you know, working 19 hours a day isn't actually an increase in your standard of living. <laughs> um, and of course, all of the recycling they had to do, where you're expected to like put out all your tin cans and everything all the time. There were, of course, food rationing. I still got some old ration books uh, from my grandparents' stuff from the olden days. And these were all signs of a bad standard of living. This is the standard of living described by Orwell in 1984, the constant wartime economy where everything's rationed, there's shortages. That what was, that's what was going on in the United States during the war. And yeah, less unemployment because your sons, uh, your working age sons were shipped off to take a bullet in Europe. So that's that's the reality, not, oh, the economy improved because of the war. And then you can point to other examples, too, such as the Vietnam War, uh, the guns and butter policy of the 1960s. OK, we'll crank out tons of warfare related stuff for the Vietnam War. And we'll also, of course, give tons of war uh, welfare to people who aren't working. And oh, gee. Guess what? It's not a coincidence that was followed by massive 1970s inflation, because how was the war financed? By money printing and by, of course, eventually uh, severing the last connection between the dollar and gold so that they could continue to run up massive deficits. So when your standard of living declined throughout the 70s and into the early 80s, that was you paying for the Vietnam War. And for some reason, it well, people have uh, this view of these Russian nationalists that you mentioned, right? Oh, look. Uh, my income went up because I'm in a war-related industry and unemployment went down. Well, that's all from Russian inflation as well. They have high inflation rates there, plenty of money printing. And it's the same thing that the U.S. has done on many occasions later, followed, of course, uh, by inflation. Because these wars that the U.S. and anybody enters into in the modern world are generally uh, financed by deficits. And you can see that right now. All of that money sent to Ukraine by the United States, that's printed money. There is no, there, there's no money there to send to Ukraine. It's all newly created money. And so you're going to be, you and your children will be paying for that in terms of deficits, in terms of inflation. You're already paying for it, really. And so let's just get out of our minds this idea that war is good for the economy. I, to be fair, I haven't encountered many people under age 40 who actually <laughs> will use that phrase. But I know plenty of people from uh, the mid 20th century were sufficiently brainwashed into that idea. So it does endure. And I, two points on what, what you just said. One is that all this deficit spending means that the, the cost that will have to be paid back down the road is going to be much higher because of interest on this debt. Uh, depending on how the Fed, you know, what it does in the, in the next year, but the estimate, I believe, from the CBO right now is that between April of this year and April of next year, there'll be something like $1.7 trillion in interest payments from the federal government. This is sort of, this is like really <laughs> worrisome in terms of future sustainability. And I would point back to the Brown, the Watson Institute at uh, Brown. They have the cost of war project and they factor in, you know, estimated interest payments, which adds trillions of dollars to the <laughs> direct immediate monetary cost of, of, you know, Iraq and Afghanistan. But I'd also point out that it seems, I would say that Austrians are, are, at least as far as I've seen, are some of the only people who notice this, but all of the inflation distorts price calculation. So there's actually frequently a consumption of uh, capital resources uh, during a wartime economy, where it's like, oh, look at these, you know. Uh, you know the I don't know what the the little independent car factory they had back back in the day of the 1940s. Like now they're making jeeps or tanks or whatever. Oh, look at all the money they're just raking in hand over fist. But if we could actually view the real state of the economy, uh, not distorted by all the rampant inflation and whatnot, they're actually 
probably actually losing money in the long term in terms of not factoring in capital depreciation and things like that. Uh, so it's just, uh, it's very worrisome, I would say, in terms of uh, where, just where the future is going, it seems, were a catastrophe to happen. I'm not convinced that the powers that be will <laughs> will have learned any lessons from the past. I mean, obviously not if we get into a war with Russia over Ukraine, obviously. Crazy people are running the show. But two, were that to happen, we can't expect that they would wage the war in a sensible manner on the economic front. And I, I love this quote from Murray Rothbard in this piece he wrote in 1950 called The Economics of War, where he goes through and basically, you know, points out sort of a very material-centric view of the war, resources and whatnot are essential. And he attacks all of the inflation policy, he attacks all the rationing and stuff, is like, this is all just crazy. But at the end of the piece, he says, the object of a war economy is to win the war as rapidly as possible. War is itself the supreme, supreme immorality. And any regime which hampers its successful and swift conclusion is also immoral. So I think that's just, uh, you know, it hits. Uh, I love Mises's quote. I think it's on the back of human action about how economics is essential to uh, human life. It's the, the pith and pit of <laughs> human existence. And it, it really is, in a way, a new science that is just not fully hasn't sunk in to everyone yet, and there's been all sorts of speculation to as as to why that is. Well, just as, a, as an illustration of how bizarre uh, wartime ideas of efficiency are and how little they have to do with, with concepts of economic calculation in terms of saving and investment and uh, are you delivering uh, something to uh, the economy? What are you producing? There's, there's some good information in a great book on the Second World War by Paul Fussell. Uh, Fussell is this, he was actually, a, I think, a professor of like literary studies or something, but he wrote these great books. He wrote a book on the domestic culture uh, during World War I in the United States, but he was a World War II veteran in Europe. And he also wrote this book called Wartime, Understanding and Behavior in the Second World War. I would highly recommend this book uh, for anyone interested in the concept of war and foreign policy. And he's also has spoken at the Mises Institute, his great talk uh, that you can find on Mises.org. But uh, one of his chapters that I really like and I think illustrates this issue of when war really comes down to a war between two peer countries that are e somewhat evenly matched, it's, it's easy when it's the U.S. versus Iraq or some backwater with hardly any money to talk in terms of uh, finesse and uh, and special weapons and uh, where, uh, smart bombs and that sort of thing, because you have the time and the luxury to really just take your time and, and be really uh, careful about who you're targeting. And that sort of, of course, I mean, I, I don't want to imply that I'm thinking the U.S. effort avoided killing civilians or anything <laughs> like that. The, the, the accuracy of those weapons was greatly overstated. However, there wasn't the level of carpet bombing that you see in a war between uh, two peer countries because that's just what the, the hysteria of war and the need to just crank out weapons as fast as you can necessitates in these cases where you're actually fearful that you might lose, which of course the US was never concerned about in any of its Middle Eastern wars. Uh, but in wartime, one of his early chapters, he talks about the weapons that, how at the beginning of World War II, they had an idea very similar to the United States has had off and on in recent decades, which is, oh, this is a new war. And we're going to produce very modern weapons, and uh, we're going to have very specialized troops, and and everything's going to going to be very targeted. We would never bomb a city filled with civilians. That's just going to be unnecessary in the modern world. Um, and he talks about how well that just ends up going right out the door by 1943. Is completely dead. Uh, and he says here uh, by the end. Early ideas of finesse, accuracy, and subtlety had yielded to the demands of getting the job over at any cost. 
If early on the soldiers had spent many tedious hours practicing marksmanship, by the end it was clear that precision would never win the war, only intensification would. Thus the troops abandoned aiming at precise targets and instead simply poured assault fire, quote unquote, in the general direction of the enemy while moving towards him. Because the shapely Thompson submachine gun took too much time to manufacture, and here's where we get into these interesting notions of efficiency, uh, the, the precise Thompson submachine gun, it, that, was too, that took too much time to make. So uh, it was replaced by the crude pressed metal M3 grease gun, which it looked like. Since what was wanted, it was finally realized, was a weapon to spew out 45 caliber slugs with more regard for quantity than for accuracy. Now, if you've ever watched one of these World War II movies, there's always like a couple of guys in the unit that have one of these grease guns. And the rest of the guys, they actually have the, uh, the M1 rifle, uh, which was way more accurate and reliable. But you're always, as a kid, you're always thinking, why don't they just give everybody one of these machine guns that just spews <laughs> out tons of rounds, right? Why didn't all the troops have that? Well, they considered that and they tried that. Um, but, and it turned out that that was very useful in terms of just, you know, just showering the other side with bullets. But it turns out, as Fussell talks here, um, a lot of the troops actually preferred the M1 in the end because it would go through walls and like multiple trees and multiple human bodies uh, at, at once. And so you can see here this kind of back and forth in terms of like, oh, well, we're going to create this very high quality rifle for our troops. But then it turns out that the quality isn't how you would define quality, that it's something else entirely. And this is just part, I just found this to be a, an interesting, um, kind of couple of paragraphs. But what it really came down to was industrial warfare, just throwing out as many bombs and shells as humanly possible. And he he quotes a song here where they talked about <laughs> um, that some of the troops were, it was like a poem essentially. And uh, they're talking about like this German weapons manufacturer, Krupp. And the line is, for every shell Krupp fired, General Motors sent back four. The idea was America's going to win this war because we can send out four shells for every one shell that the Germans can produce. And this was certainly true about airplanes. I mean, another thing he mentions here is that in 1940, Roosevelt called for the building of 50,000 planes. Um, when asked for a time limit, <laughs> Roosevelt blandly said that was the number he wanted each year. And before the war was over, the United States had produced over 300,000 planes, 11,000 of which were in the air over France on D-Day alone. And this is a point that some other observers of American warfare have noted. And it's, it's true now, and it's always been true, uh, at least for 100 years, is the United States is the opposite of pioneers in strategy and tactical <laughs> brilliance. The United States has never been known for that. The United States wins wars because it hurls huge numbers of weapons at the enemy and just overwhelms them. The Americans have, have always been utterly clueless in terms of creativity and, oh, we're going we're gonna to execute this sneaky maneuver. Americans never do that. They just, <laughs> oh, well, we'll just make 300,000 planes and that will destroy the enemy. And that is the American way of warfare. And so you can see how closely tied that is to economic output and how much it requires of the government to steal the savings and the wealth and the income of Americans in order to win wars. And this can just never be forgotten. Yeah. it, uh, And we see that now, uh, your point about high tech, basically, coming back. Uh, I, I believe that uh, there was recently a report that the, the federal government has rejected half uh, these days is rejecting half of the F-35s that, uh, I forget who makes it, Boeing or Lockheed, whoever, uh, you know, sends to it. The F-35 is apparently a very advanced, great stealth fighter, but it is, it requires an army of people to be maintaining it at all times, all this sort of stuff. It's a, it's a very precision instrument. And this is the same for all of our anti-air defenses, all sorts of stuff these days. And uh, I mean, I think the they can churn out like less than 200 F-35s a year. That obviously is not adequate if there were to be a, a full-blown 
war of attrition. And uh, to your point way back from the introduction about how Russia was using all this Soviet stuff, they're still using Soviet stuff. <laughs> and they, uh, uh, one interesting point that they're now, has now ramped up a lot. It sort of has started last year, but now it's ramped up a lot, is they, they're taking dumb bombs I think the smallest of which is 250 kilograms, and there's like 500 kilograms is the most common, and then they go up from there. So these are dumb bombs that are meant to just be dropped from giant, big strategic bombers and whatnot. Well, uh, and this is another interesting point that is of concern, I suppose, to the U.S. military because it's so reliant on on the Air Force rather than standard tube artillery. Uh, there's no neither Ukraine nor Russia has really secured air superiority over Ukraine. So they couldn't use all these bombs. So they had to use, you know, gajillion dollar uh, missiles and, and, and whatnot. Well, for about $20,000, they can slap on this kit now to these dumb bombs and l drop them from, uh, I don't know, about, I think about 40 kilometers away from the target and they're basically whatever the Russian equivalent of GPS is guided. So, so, so they're glide bombs now. So it's quite, I mean, it's quite ingenious and interesting. I mean, and it's sort of amusing the way in which Russia is just pulling out all this stuff from the Soviet uh, cold storage. Um, and there was a bunch of duds and stuff because this stuff, I mean, I literally, one of the first bombs I saw, it has like someone was explaining what the, things meant on, on the side of the bomb and it was built it was manufactured in 1963 <laughs> um but it it's quite interesting just in terms of uh russia relying on just cheap old stuff that is accomplishing the task at hand and they do of course have expensive hypersonic missile systems that are very expensive, but here it's like this is twenty grand versus a million dollars plus. Um, but of course, you know uh, the vast Soviet stockpiles <laughs> accumulated over decades are not infinite. So that's you know to get back to why they're doing this buildup. But one thing I wanted to bring up, just because it sort of touches on the cost of war. You know, we're talking about the economics of war. All of this, uh, you know, militarization of society, uh, you know, uh, spending half the GDP or more building things to be blown up, doesn't just cost things in terms of like, oh, we don't, we can't have any as many knickknacks and widgets as before. It has a cost on the structure of society, and I was entirely ignorant of this until last week. Um, when I saw a reference to the, something called the Lansdowne, Lansdowne Peace Letter, which was written by the Marquis, Marquis of Lansdowne, who was a, a very prominent British politician before and during World War I. But in, I think, December of 1917, he published, uh, he had this letter published in a British newspaper where he's like, maybe we should, you know, put out feelers for peace, or at least, at the very least, figure out like what on what conditions we would make peace, because we haven't really figured that out other than just we have to beat the Germans. And and he is like, well, we've been trying that for a long time now, and this war is very expensive, uh, so uh, we should figure out if it's worth all this expense. And he was attacked viciously. Uh, but he, 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 he has apparently received just bundles and bags and bags of letters from people saying, oh, I totally agree with what you're saying. But what I found was very interesting. I kept saying references that he'd actually been in the cabinet in the 1916 government and had made this argument then, which apparently the British government was a little bit more, um, uh, friendly to, uh, and he just in this memo, which we'll link in the uh, in the show notes, because I went and found it in the British archives online, uh, he's pointing out we've had a a million one hundred thousand casualties, and this was right after the Somme offensive had gone nowhere, basically. And then he's like, "We're we're racking up five million pounds of debt a day, which was much more money back then than it is now." 
Uh, and basically, we're like at risk of destroying civilization. Uh, so I really love this quote where he says, it is nonetheless our duty to consider after a careful review of the facts what our plight is and the plight of the civilized world will be after another year, or as, or, uh, as we are sometimes told, two or three more years of a struggle ex as exhausting as that in which we are engaged. So he at least was very aware this is costing not just money, it's costing lives, but it's just undermining the very fabric of civilization. And um, Robert Nisbet in his book, The Present Age, also has a great section on just how a war totally undermines the moral fabric of society, hugely increases promiscuity, all sorts of things. But what, what's very telling is, so he put this out in cabinet, and the chief of the Imperial War Staff then wrote a response. And this response was basically uh, just, because to clarify, Lansdowne had been like, is a decisive breakthrough that will allow us to impose terms on Germany. How feasible and likely is that? Because the, <laughs> the Somme offensive just basically failed right now, and there are things not going well on the Eastern Front in Romania and things. And the chief of the of staff was like, we need more economic production on the home front. You know, we need more resources and we will win if we deserve to win. And he basically called Lansdow a coward and a philosopher, a pacifist, all this stuff, which Lansdow is definitely not. He makes it very clear, you know, he doesn't want to just well, let's just throw in the towel. He's like, maybe, you know, we're not getting anywhere here. The cost of anything we can achieve is now not worth the price we'll have to pay. Uh, and I also have, I, I, the we'll link to both Lansdow's original memo, the response from the chief of staff and Lansdow's response to the chief of staff, where he's like, this was less than helpful. <laughs> and he basically like, uh, and he points out that the chief of staff said that all oh, lots of economic considerations and things are outside of the purview of the judgment of the chief of staff. And then Lansdow goes back and is like, yes, that's exactly true. So we sort of should probably take stock of, of these other factors. And uh, so I think that's quite um, relevant and it obviously has implications today in the war with ukraine which is going nowhere fast Pe people are like oh russia's making breakthroughs which russia is making quote unquote breakthroughs but they're they're like breakthroughs in the context of like the western front of world war one it's like oh my goodness you know uh they they gained 150 square yards today i mean it's possible there could be a complete Ukrainian collapse, but that's not by any means a foregone conclusion. So I do think that people who are economically literate and conscious of like the reality of the economic material factors of war see that this is not, not a great situation. And I am not a fan of Mark Milley, the former Joint Chief of Staff of the US, but to his credit, in the fall of 2022, he was like, gee, this is probably the high water mark. The U.S. Uh, should, you know, push Ukraine to make a deal now because it's just going downhill for them from there. But then we get people in the West who, uh, you know, seem to think war is not so much a matter of material reality as like moral resolve. <laughs> uh, and it's like, you know, more support. And that's why we get the scary talk of sending NATO troops into for now, Western Ukraine to operate in non-combatant roles, but that is so scary and terrifying. So all of this ties back to economics and why it's so essential. It's not just some, you know, siloed discipline that's disconnected from war. It's really the essential foundation of war. I love Mises's quote that wars can only be waged with present goods. Uh, so. That's why I think this is a subject people need to pay more attention to, study up on, and be prepared to combat more and more bad proposals coming out of our own government, unfortunately. All right. Well, I think that's an excellent summary of uh, <laughs> what we're trying to say here today. So I'll go ahead and let that be the last word here.
on this episode of War, Economy, and State. Um, as we noted, you can always get more content like this at Mises.org. That's M-I-S-E-S dot O-R-G. And we'll link to a lot of these articles and books in the description as well. And thank you for listening to this episode. We'll be back next month with another one. So we'll see you next time.